faster. And today we're having an all age service, um, so the children are going to be staying in. Uh, if there's a bit of noise as we go along, that's all right. We, uh, we don't mind. Um, and of course, at all age service, we have, as part of our refreshments, we have cakes. In this week. It's, uh, chocolate brownies, courtesy of Louise, so uh, we look forward to that. Stay to the end. Um, let's have a, a look at this uh, psalm. Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. It's a, it's a hymn that we come to the God who is compassionate and powerful enough to do all those things. And we can look forward to that. We know that um, many of us, uh, many in the congregation, feel that desire we want to have our, uh, our youth renewed yeah. like the eagles. And uh, of course, we, we look forward to the day we get a new body. So let's, uh, let's come to him in prayer at the beginning of our service. Father God, we do thank you and praise you that we can come to you now and worship you and learn from you. And I pray that you help us to do that. I pray that you will speak to us and um, give us ears to hear and hearts to uh, acknowledge and understand and obey and respond in faith. We do thank you for it goodness to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, what we're going to be doing today is singing from uh, the, re the recorded songs because uh, I wanted to give um, Mike a Sunday off from his responsibilities playing. So um, we're going to sing along to the pre-recorded songs. I'm going to start with Lord I Lift Your Name. Stand and sing together, and then after this, we'll sing Behold Our God. <clears throat> Oh, no. 
Nothing can compare. Come, let us adore Him. Who has given counsel to the Lord? Who can question? So, a few notices to highlight. Um, <coughs> prayer meeting continues at 8.45 each morning on Zoom. Please join us if you can. If you can't be there, then um, between that first quarter of an hour or so, just uh, if you can be praying for the church, joining us in that as we pray for God to guide us and direct us and the future of the church. Um, home groups, um, life groups, they continue. 
Tuesday and Wednesday. And if you're in those groups, then you know when they are. And uh, tomorrow, we've got our monthly prayer meeting. That'll be on Zoom at 8 p.m. So uh, that's particularly helpful. If you can't make the morning prayer meeting, then you can come and join us tomorrow evening at uh, 8 o'clock. And then uh, next week, we have our big Sunday. So this is the first of our new initiatives to uh, do something that's a bit different, a chance for us to work on getting to know God better, the big Sunday. Um, so we're going to meet here as normal, and then afterwards we're going to make our way over to the Scout Hut for a fellowship lunch, and that will be followed by a time of going into the Bible a bit more in depth. So um, do come along to that if you can. If you would like to uh, be at the fellowship lunch in order to plan and organise and make sure that we know who's coming and we've got enough food, there is a sign-up sheet there on the refreshments table, so you can't miss it when you go over there to get your chocolate brownie. You'll be reminded that there's uh, food to think about for next week. So do sign up to be there, and uh, if you can bring something along, then brilliant. That can, uh, that's how it works. We will bring something more than enough normally for everybody to eat. And then the Sunday after that, the 19th, um, we're going to have a visitor. Um, Jonathan Bond is going to be coming to join us for that morning. And uh, he is the FIEC Director of Smaller Churches. So we belong to the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches, FIEC. So a fellowship of about 600 or so churches and um, Jonathan Bond is the one whose job is to kind of look after and encourage smaller churches which I know it's hard to believe but we actually count as a smaller church um, so it's his job to encourage us so he's coming to preach in a couple of weeks time uh, he's actually coming on the Saturday and he's going to meet with us as a leadership team on the Saturday evening we're going to just uh, chat to him about what we've been doing and where we sort of see ourselves possibly going or not seeing ourselves at the moment. We're, you know, we're struggling to find our way, praying to God about that and seeing what he might say and how he might encourage us. So uh, that's something to really prioritise and be there. I think it'd be good to have him come and meet with us and be an encouragement. Now... What, uh, what are we going to do? Let's have a look at this first, I think. Let's have a look at this um, picture here. So, what colours do you see on that picture? What colours can you see? So, you can see a blue and a pink, yeah? Blue, pink, purple, yellow. You can't see any yellow. Where's the yellow, Emily? Do you want to show us the yellow? Come up, come up here. Use my magic pen. Hang on. Right. So, um, show us. Draw a circle on there where you see yellow. Just there. So that's yellow. Who sees yellow? Oh, God, yes. There it is. You don't see yellow, Sophie. Everyone's green. It's black. It's green as well. It's green. Where's green? It's under. It's above it. It's just above it. Perhaps if we turn to the moon. Do you want to circle the green? That's turquoise, is it? <laughs> is that, um, so some people might say green, others might say turquoise. But, um, bluey green. So we've got bluey green. So we've got green, we've got yellow. But, but Sophie can't see the yellow. So what, what colour? In between the black lines, I mean, we can see there's black here, but aren't these bits yellow? No? Can't see it. Let's look closer, shall we? Let's zoom in. Is it yellow or 
Yeah, can you see it? A bit. Can you see the yellow now? Look, everybody, looking closely, can you see now? Shall we look even closer? Where's the yellow gone? It's white. It's white. If I change the picture, I've just zoomed in. Actually, Sophie was right. You, thought, you all thought she was colour blind, but somehow her eyes see more true. And you, you turn, you come out, and it looks like it's yellow. Because of the trick that your eyes are played on by all these colours and the lines, it makes it look, but those, that, that bit that's meant to be yellow, or looks yellow, is white. Bizarre, isn't it? So, sometimes we don't see what we should see, or sometimes we see things that aren't even there. We see yellow when there's white. <coughs> Right, we're going to read a bit of the Bible now, and Sophie's going to come and read to us. She's going to read uh, Mark eight chapter, uh, Mark chapter eight verse twenty. No, she's going to read. That's wrong. She's going to read twenty-two to twenty-six. Come out here and uh, come up to the front and read to us, Sophie. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When, the, when he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, Do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more Jesus put his eyes once more Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened, his sight was restored, and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, Don't go into the village. Thank you, thank you, Sophie. That's great. Well right, so He's read a story, or Sophie's read us a story about a miracle. And the man could see, just like that. Or was it just like that? No, because it happened in two steps, two stages, didn't it? What happened? How did, how did Jesus heal the man? How did he do the miracle? Put his hands on his eyes, not just putting his hands on his eyes. Spat on his hands. Spat. It's a bit nasty. Would you do would you like that if, you, if somebody spat and put their fingers in your eyes? Yuck. But they thought of spit as having healing properties. Spit could actually help you and get better. We wouldn't think of it that way now because, well, it's just we just think of it as being a bit disgusting. But, Jesus' spit, it seems, is really powerful. But maybe not powerful enough, because what could he see? When Jesus spat, rubbed his, touched his eyes, what could he see? People. Trees. Trees. He saw people, but they looked like trees. So maybe, was that because Jesus wasn't powerful enough? Or was he trying to teach a lesson? You see, this is connected to a question that Jesus wanted to ask. First of all, he performed a miracle. Then he talked to his disciples and asked them a question. I'll read this bit. Jesus, so this is straight after that. It says, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, Others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. <coughs> Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Who do you say I am? 
That's the question that Jesus really wants to ask his disciples. And when he healed the man, it's kind of teaching us a lesson to go along with that question. You see, the question is about what you see of Jesus. Do you see him clearly or not? And the answer, well, the first thing to learn is that some people see nothing. Some people are like the man who is blind. They're blind to Jesus. You ask them, who is Jesus? And they really don't, don't know. Or what they learn about him, it just doesn't seem to stick. Where were they? Well, they were in a place called Beth Bethsaida. There, Bethsaida, and then that's where the miracle was performed. And then Jesus took them up to Caesarea Philippi. Just there. Caesarea Philippi. Now, as you can see, that's over to the east <coughs> of the country. Over to the east. And actually, that's kind of the border of where your, your Jews would live. So Caesarea Philippi, well, if you listen to the name of the town, it's named after the ruler of the Roman Empire, Caesar. Caesarea Philippi. So it's a place that is really important to the Romans, and they, they sort of look up to their special king, Caesar. Um, it's not full of Jews and people like Jesus. So why is it he's taking them out to a this special place. Now, wouldn't it be good to see what the place looked like? Um, oh, funny enough, oh sorry, I forgot. I've got pictures from when I was there. <laughs> so this is Caesarea Philippi now, obviously there's a lot of ruins there, but it was a well built up kind of Roman town, small city maybe, named after the Roman Emperor. Um, why? Well, because there were springs nearby that gave it, made it a very fertile, lush place. But what that led to for many, many years was worship. There was a temple there to Pan, who was a Greek god. And Pan was this kind of god who you would sacrifice children to, believe it or not. That really did happen. That they would take little babies and they would actually sacrifice to Pan. Probably not by the time Jesus was there, because this was a Greek god, but it was a place where lots of gods were worshipped, um, partly because it was connected to this lush, fertile land. So that little cave there, that was a place where these sacrifices would happen. Horrific. So it's a place where people have, they've established, we, we really do believe in our King Caesar. Romans and a place where people love to worship their gods. And it's around there that Jesus asks this question Who do you say I am? And so, really, what he's asking when he says, Who do you say I am? He's asking a couple of questions. Okay, we're going to Caesarea Philippi, where people have really put their colours to, yeah, we believe that Caesar is our king. But who is your king? And we go to Caesarea Philippi, where people worship this God who is, uh, you know, demands everything, your own children. Who is your God? That's the question that Jesus is really putting to his disciples. Who is your king? Who is your God? Now, other people, he, said, he started off by saying, well, what do other people say about what do the others think I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. So they're looking at all these other people. They're not thinking of who Jesus is at all. He's certainly not a God. He's certainly not their God. And he's certainly not a king. He's just a prophet. So they do respect him. But they don't see Jesus as a king or as God. Many people today see Jesus as somebody who's interesting. He's worth knowing about, but don't, we don't need to obey him. He's not like a king. We certainly don't need to worship him. Jesus is interesting, 
maybe we can learn something from his teachings. But let's keep him a bit more distant than all of that. So that's the first thing, is that some people, some see nothing. They look at Jesus, they don't see him at all. Right, what we're going to do is we're going to sing a song before we look at the next thing. And we are going to have one song with live music. And when I say music, I mean drums. <laughs> we're going to sing the Hoot Cha Cha song. So, actually you should have put the, uh, ask the other percussion instruments to come. We're going to play it with the, I'm going to play this. So, let's all stand up. going that way, do you think? Yeah. It looks, yeah. No, the bit uh, around the outs, the, the sort of set next to the middle is going around that way perhaps, and then, is anything moving? Nothing. No. Yeah, I can see it a little bit. Like Only the centre, off and on. It's just a picture, it's not a video or anything, it's just a picture. <laughs> but look at this design, so that as you look at it, it looks like it's moving, but it's not, it's just staying oh, still. Yeah, the other bit's moving. Oh, I'll move, I'll tell you, before anybody gets um, a, bit, a bit sick. All right, so how many camels do you see? Yeah. How many camels can you count? Whoa. Oh. Five. Five sets of feet. Five? Six. 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 How about if you put, okay, who wants to... Five? Emily, do you want to show us where the five are? Emily? Do you want to show us where the five are? Put a, put a, a red dot on the each of them. Can you see? That's good. Well, put the next one on. Put 
three, four, five. Okay. So that's brilliant. Oh dear. Are you okay? Five. Okay, let's clear that. Let's, um, Sophie, do you want to show us? You say there's six. Six dots. Nice and hard. One, that's it. Two, three, four, five, six. So there's two behind there. It's, it's like you kept, their heads are hidden, aren't they? So that's it. Well, who, who thinks? Okay, let's have a vote. Who thinks five? You think five. Helen, Mike, Jean, Fran. Who thinks six? Most people think six. So, those of you that think five, you agree with Emily? Has anybody got any idea about this one here? That's not a camel, though. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a llama or something, isn't it? It's a llama or something. No, not a llama. I mean, one thing we, we know it hasn't got, it hasn't got a hump. So what do we know it certainly isn't? It isn't a camel. So is it a llama? Is it a... It's a llama. A long enough neck. It's the, yeah, I mean, llamas do have very long necks, don't they? I think what it is, is just uh, something that's put there to throw you off. So I, I think I would go with Sophie's in that I think there are two kind of where you can't see their heads and they're hidden, so you've got two there. Mm -hmm. and, um, these two here, <coughs> one, two, three, four, five. So I would say there are five camels, which is what Emily said, that the five are the ones that Sophie saw, if you know what I mean. So you have to look, sometimes you see things that other people don't, but even then, do you see everything that you need to be able to see it as clearly as you need to be able to see it. Well, let's, um, some people see nothing, but some people do see something. It's a two-stage miracle, you see. Um, they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. And it's interesting, there's this group of people who care about the blind man, do they care about the blind man? Or do they care about seeing a miracle? But there's this blind man, and there's a good picture for us. A blind, a pic, a, the blind man, the healing of the blind man, is a picture for people who are blind to Jesus. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. You see, Jesus is not interested in putting on a show He's interested in showing compassion to people. And when he had spat on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. So he's healed him partly. Not because Jesus can't heal him completely. It's not that Jesus lacks power. It's that he wants to teach a lesson. And it's what follows on next when he talks to the disciples. Who do you people say I am? Some people say this, some people say that. Well, then he says, what about me? Who do you say I am? Peter said, you are the Christ. Peter sees Jesus as Christ. Now, what does Christ mean? Who's, when you call Jesus Christ, is that just discerning Jesus Christ? No. You're right, Emily. That's not his surname. That's actually like a title. Do you know what Christ means? Who, tell, who can tell me what Christ means? Adults are allowed to chip in on this one. Messiah. So it's another word for Messiah. Okay, and what does that mean? I didn't understand that one. You had your finger in your mouth. Anybody? What does Christ or Messiah mean? Anointed one. What's that mean? 
basically his point is is God's king. So think of Christ and think king. But don't just think any old king. Think God's chosen king, God's promised king. The king we're all waiting to see. The king that all the people of God are waiting for. That God has been promising. So you are the Christ. It's a big deal if Jesus really is the Christ. (coughs) Peter saw something that other people hadn't seen. Do we see Jesus as important? As somebody who is our king? As somebody that we should obey? Because we might love Jesus or we might like Jesus, we might want to learn about Jesus, but are we ready to obey him? Because he's the king and the king should be obeyed. Who is your king? The answer should be Jesus. But notice that that's as far as we've got. And for some people, that's only that's all they'll see of Jesus, is that so long as I keep Jesus' laws, so long as I keep the Ten Commandments, so long as I'm good and don't break any of the rules, then I'll be fine. Because Jesus is only a rule-making leader to them. So long as I go to church, so long as I pray and read the Bible, then I'll be all right. But have we understood that Jesus is more than just the king? He is somebody that we can have more of a relationship with. Who is your king? Is it Jesus? But there's also this question, who is your God? Well, we're going to sing again. We're going to sing, oh, and we've got the music, not just drums for this one. Um, so we're going to sing, stand, stand, sing, oh, praise his, <coughs> praise your name.
Now, um, before we carry on, Mike would like to come and say a few words. Hmm. Hopefully I'll hold it together in my crack, you'll have to bear with me. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to everyone from the family and myself for your prayers, for your kind words and you know, offers of support. That's been a great comfort and, and strength to us during this time. Uh, most of you know um, from the Zoom prayer meetings and other times that my mother over the last few years has been 87 years old. She's been partially um, not handicapped, but the mobility is, is, is she struggled, um, particularly after a, a knee joint replacement. And her health has been going downhill, and particularly over the last few months, she's had a number of falls and has just been uh, getting weaker and weaker. And it all sort of culminated, I guess, a couple of, probably two weeks ago, um, when carers came in first thing in the morning to her and found her with a fever and unresponsive, taken into a &E, and my sister and I were with her. And it was a pretty touching go then. She was really dehydrated, she got an infection, and she was on intravenous antibiotics and fluids, and a &E. There was some doubt whether she would even recover at that point, but you know, she's a fighter, she, uh, she did bounce back, she got onto the ward, but over the coming weeks, uh, coming week, it became apparent from the tests that they were doing that her kidneys had been damaged and she was, you know, they were continuing to deteriorate. Um, so what I wanted to do this morning really was just to say, <laughs> That despite, you know, despite hardship, pain, suffering, you know, that God is good. We, in our life group, have been looking at the, the names of God and how they, how, how God, um, how we see those, tri you know, tributes of God as working in our lives um, and how we should be praising Him for them. And the one that really, uh, over the last few days, that's really come to me is the Jehovah Jireh, uh, God our provider. And in our home group, we saw that God our provider doesn't really encompass everything that the original language, uh, you know, it translates because it's, it's more than just a provider. It, it talks about the God who goes ahead of us. So he's preparing uh, things in advance. And Jesus himself you know, said that he went uh, to prepare a place for us. You know, this uh, making, you know, this just getting everything in order for us. And just particular things that have happened over the last few days days that, that where I've just seen that evidence and I was having a conversation with, with Colin on, I think it was the, um, on, on Tuesday meeting that um, you know, my mother was dying basically and there was no chance of her recovery and I didn't even know if she knew and visiting her most of the time she was asleep when she was awake she'd be confused sometimes didn't even recognise me I wanted the assurance that she was going to be with God and, and her faith where she stood. And I said, I don't even know how to bring that conversation up. And it's such a difficult thing. How do you tell or have a conversation with your own mother when she's dying? Do you know you're dying? And are you right with God? Well, that very afternoon, she had a, a lucid moment when I was with her. Sin. I think I'm dying. And I was able to say to him, Well, if you think you're dying, have you made peace with God? She said, Yes. She said, I'm ready. Just a wonderful assurance, and, and then just you know, as time went on, she was constantly saying that she wanted to go home, pleading, just begging. And it's so hard to say you can't because you've been monitored and you've got all these 
medications going on and you need to get stronger. Uh, but you just said, yeah, look in her eyes, you know, just pleading. Um, and then it came a point with the doctors when we were talking about it, you know, all the things they've done. It was, um, you know, they've been consulting specialists, you know, with kidney, specialists from the hospital trying to kickstart her kidneys again. <coughs> Nothing, nothing was working, so they were talking with Jen and I, uh, my sister, about palliative care and putting her into a side room um, so that family could come and visit. And it was just, it just seemed so hard. And then there was a, the um, discharge, um, integrated discharge team, whatever she was, was called, a lovely, lovely lady. She said, well, what do you, you know, what do you want? What do your mother want? And I said, well, she's all the time. She said, I said, go home. And she said, well, we'll try and facilitate. We'll fast track it. And it can take 48 to 72 hours, but we'll try. And uh, again, we went in the next day, and Noblet came round, and she said, um, we could get your mother out this, you know, this evening, but the care home, you know, care company she was with, uh, couldn't be able to do anything for a couple of days. She said, but if she, if she was willing to change to a different one, they could do it that evening. So I said, do it. So she was home. Uh, you know, we told her she was going home. And she said, you're not you know, just saying that to make me feel better and you wouldn't be lying to me. I said, no, I'm going home. And so David and I were there when she got home and she began a little bit disorientated. She said, where am I? And I said, you're home, mum. And just the relief. Said and shared with me on a number of occasions that she didn't want to die alone. And again, God just went ahead. So, God is good. Even in you know, times of trial. So, so, I just wanted to encourage you today. Thank you, Mike. So it's, uh, it's, it's encouraging. So um, we'll uh, pray for you now. Father God in heaven, we do thank you that you are the providing God, Jehovah Jireh. You are the one who goes ahead of us and prepare the road that we have to travel. And I thank you that Sheila was able to uh, end her days having made her peace with you. Thank you for that assurance that Mike was able to get just a few days ago, that opportunity to talk to her about it. And, uh, and I do thank you that things came together, that she was able to go to be at home and that she was able to have her children particularly Mike and David to be there at that last, that last morning um, to hold her hand. Lord God, uh, I thank you for that. And I, I do pray that you will encourage Mike and Sue and Jonathan and Ben that you would uh, help them to look to you and to see your hand upon the situation. Pray also for uh, Mike's siblings, for Paul, for Jen, David as well, that you would uh, speak to them. I thank you that Paul follows you and trusts in you, and I pray that Jen and David might look to you this time, that the example that they've seen in Mike's life, and, um, looking to you and finding that hope in you uh, at times of grief. I do thank you for that, and I pray that that, that hope might speak loudly. Yes. Lord, we pray this in Jesus. So, we've been learning about some people don't see Jesus, they see nothing. Some people see something of Jesus. They recognise 
that as like Peter, they see that he is king. He is the king. But does do they see everything about him? Is Jesus just a king, a distant figure who makes the rules and we just have to keep those rules? Well, some people do see everything. They see that Jesus is more than just a king. So it was a two-stage miracle, having given the sight back partly to this man that he could see people when they looked like trees walking around. Once more Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes, then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored and he saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't go into the village. He wants to protect the man from those, those crowds who are going to mob him and say, you are healed, you, you couldn't see him, now you can see him. They just want to see the miracle. They're just excited. But Jesus wants to protect him from that. As for the disciples, just after that the situation where Peter said, you are the Christ, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and after three days, rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside, and began to rebuke him. So, Peter's just recognised something about Jesus. What has he just recognised? He recognises that Jesus is the, the Christ. The king, God's chosen king. And now Peter has decided to rebuke Jesus. What does rebuke mean? Do you know what rebuke means? What does rebuke, anybody want to tell us what a rebuke is? <coughs> it's a telling off. It's like, who do you think you are? You should stop doing what you're doing. That's a rebuke. Do you ever get rebuked? Maybe. Do you ever rebuke your mum or dad? No. You're thinking about it. What a good child you are. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yes, sometimes. No, no, never. If you met King Charles III, would you rebuke him for something? No. No. You would be very cautious about rebuking the king. If you met Jesus, would you rebuke him? No. So Peter, who has just said, you are the Christ, is now telling Jesus off. He's saying, don't talk like that. All this stuff, what's, he, what's Jesus said that's been so upsetting? Jesus began to teach them that. Son of man must suffer many things. Be rejected. Chief priests, teachers, are all going to turn against him. That he must be killed. And after three days, rise again. It's all there. But Peter says, no, Jesus, don't say such a thing. It's wrong. You're wrong. What does Jesus think of Peter's rebuke? When Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. He gave to Peter a telling off. Get behind me, Satan. He's saying the, the devil is making you talk like that. So it's a shocking thing, really. On the one hand, he sees so much. But on the other hand, he's, he's being, he's, it's like the devil's taken him made him say things that he shouldn't be saying. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of man. He doesn't see everything. Does he recognise that Jesus is more than just a king, that Jesus is in fact God? Who is your God? God is it. Jesus is my God, is what the uh, answer should be. Um, Jesus we need to see Jesus as not just the king, but also God. And a God who not just this stayed in heaven, passing out the rules, but the God who loves us, the God who came down, the God who was willing to sacrifice. Jesus died on the cross so that we could be forgiven. We do, that means we shouldn't just obey Jesus, we should worship him. Worship the king because the king is God we need to see his, Jesus is not just the king 
He is the God who made us and saved us with this huge sacrifice of love. And so we should hold nothing back. With a king, you might think, yes, I'll give you my obedience, but there are certain areas of my life that are my own, and I'm not going to obey you in everything I do. You're not a dictator, you're just the king. You just direct the affairs of state. Keep the laws. But no area of my life should be held back from Jesus. It all belongs to him. My money, my family, my work, my hobbies. Um, I don't know what aspects of your life you think belong to you and you're going to keep them just for yourself and not for Jesus. But everything we bring to him and lay it at his feet and say, this is for you, this is yours. If all that seems too much, then perhaps we haven't actually seen Jesus as clearly as we think we have. <coughs> perhaps we've only seen some of Jesus. Perhaps we still see him like a tree walking around. Let's pray that our eyes can be fully open, that we can see Jesus as clearly in all his glory as he is. Not just our King, but our God, our Saviour, the one who loves us, the one who deserves our everything. Let's, uh, let's pray. <coughs> Father God in heaven, we do thank you and we praise you for Jesus. Thank you for sending him, for establishing him as our King, for proving that he is our God. And Lord God, we do pray that you'll help us to see him clearly and to worship him as he should be worshipped and deserves to be worshipped. Lord God, we pray that you would show us Jesus. Show us Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's uh, finish by singing Oceans. The, he's the one who the oceans in his hands as we were singing earlier and uh, so we can trust him even with walking on water as uh, Peter ended up having to learn to do or failed to do
as we finish, I do want to remind you that tomorrow evening is our prayer meeting at Zoom. Um, and, uh, and I'll now finish by reading from uh, a blessing from Philippians 4. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds.